Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee to order at nine, about approximately 9.32 a.m. And um, we have an agenda, and I, I'll just say this for whoever's watching out there. Um, so the election of officers is going to wait until a little bit later. Um, and we're going to continue our um, discussion on the town council appointed non-voting members of the finance committee. Um, yeah. Could I pick up? And so, um, thank you for making us a prettier agenda, that's so nice. Um, but that really wasn't what I was going to say. What I was going to say was one of the documents that is just available to everybody this morning, in addition to your beautiful agenda, is a very rough draft of a report from this committee to the town council and the finance committee yep. people. And the only reason I did that, because that is the Oakwood designee's task, which is Darcy in this case. The only reason I did that was to pull together, I thought it would be easy to pull together the piece parts, you know, just to follow right. what our thing was. So there's a thing in our folder that's called piece parts. Okay. So it's in, it's in today's folder and all the finance committee stuff is now under a finance committee folder and to the, under today's meeting folder. So you go into today's meeting folder, you see your agenda, you go into today's meeting folder, you see the finance committee folder that has all the different things okay. that Darcy used, that, that Darcy wrote, that Darcy's addendum is in there, and then okay. I have the thing that's marked OCA draft that is just, you know, we started a conversation on the 17th, we're having another conversation on the 24th, I added another legal reference, I didn't change any of Darcy's original words, I tried to insert the uh, Thing that shows how we advertised for members yes. and stuff, you know, all that right. added stuff. I was trying to put it all in one document. I may need Evan's help to <laughs> possibly go through that. So Evan to get some of that finished because I don't think I quite got it right in some cases. But that is something we can take a look at just in terms of I know we often don't have any notes kind of thing to work from, okay. right, because we just leave it right. to the person who's writing the report. But we have, we have those piece parts available to us if we want them. Alrighty, and where are they? So if you go into today's meeting folder, you'll see Sarah's agenda that starts with the word agenda, surprisingly, <laughs> as opposed to so the I'm so creative. agenda right. thing. And then you'll also see an actual folder that talks about the finance committee stuff. And it's called, it's a, it is labeled piece parts. Okay, I just, uh, you know, I, I spent several hours on this yesterday too, so I. So this is just trying to pull together some parts, so hopefully if it's duplicative, then you don't need it, and if it's not, great. All right. So the last time that we started discussing the um, appointments to the, for the non-voting members, resident non-voting members to the finance committee. Um, one of the things that came up was that uh, there was a, that someone had, had applied and um, their CAF will just say it, it didn't, it didn't make it to, um, to us. So we have we have that to discuss and, and what that means to us. We still need to speak to Darcy and we need to talk a little about process. We also need to look at the, the names that were proposed to us and decide whether we would like to recommend or not recommend. Um, I am not sure how this committee would like to handle. It's sort of a, a ball of yarn. It's a little tangled how we want to just start picking that apart. We do have Angela here right now who is going to speak to us. So. My feeling is that if Angela's here right now, we should let her speak and we can do that. We'll start picking that ball apart that way. So, hi Angela, thank you for being here today. <laughs> it's my pleasure. So, I'm wondering if you wanna maybe just speak to, we when our last meeting we just kind of found out that this is what had happened and we were like, oh, oh, it happened and we didn't have much discussion after that or really any information. So maybe you could just talk to us about what you know about it and then I'll sort of let 
the conversation, you know, go. Yep, George. Uh, we need to appoint a minute taker. Oh. We'll check it. Who is should there? be me? Because Darcy needs to. Yeah, she's got on. a lot on sure. her plate, um, okay. and so, um, but I think we should have a minute taker. Agreed. Absolutely. I'm so sorry. I thought you guys had worked that out, and I didn't realize that. No, so yes, that's okay. thank you, George. Right. I appreciate that. Good. So I will start taking minutes. Do you, would you like us to give you a few just to get no, organized? Yeah, okay. You're good. Okay. Sorry about that. I apologize. Sorry, Angela. It's okay. okay. So my name is Angela Mills, and in my position as executive assistant to the town manager, one of my responsibilities this spring has been to coordinate the interviews for candidates for boards, committees, and commissions. Um, I take full responsibility for that from start to finish. In fact, I recently took the responsibility for issuing the appointment letters and making sure that copies of those get to staff liaisons and the clerk's office in a timely fashion. I call people who mark off more than one committee, board, or commission, or who just simply mark general interests, and I have a pretty wide-ranging conversation with them. For several of those people, um, I reach out to them again by email and by phone when they remain unappointed or are in limbo to see if they'd like to come back in for different boards and committees and commissions. For the person that didn't make your list, I just, I recall having what I consider to be an extensive conversation, which in my line of work means more than three minutes, less than 20 minutes. <laughs> and the conversation really went something like this. You've marked off these things in our calendar. These three are coming up for appointment in the next few weeks. What interests you most? Um, Again, I take full responsibility for that name, not getting on your full list of people who had expressed interest. But at the time, I knew that person had been appointed to a different committee or commission and had expressed that one commitment, in my, from my recollection, one commitment was sufficient in that person's view for their time. So I guess that, thank you, Angela. Um, so I guess that that, you know, as we sort of are doing this, we're, make, we're sort of making this all a, a practice or a procedure as we go. So one of the things that we didn't really expressly even think of to talk about was when we talk about the pool, what exactly does the pool mean and what do we want it to mean? So I think that there's a couple things that, you know, that we need to decide and then communicate clearly um, is what we mean by the pool and then what, you know, OCA feels that they need to have for information going in. Is this something that I can think of immediately that, that comes to mind? And then the other, is it something we're struggling with, which is the, the community activity form? What does it say and, and, and how when it comes in somewhere, how are people notified and how especially is OCA notified? So those are two things that I can think of that I don't, think that we necessarily, maybe we thought that we made clear, maybe we didn't make it clear, but I think it's something that we should discuss here, and those are the two things on the top of my head that I can think of that are, are things that are pertinent to this issue that happened. And I'm wondering if, yep, Darcy? I think this is also related to just um, <clears throat> communications with the applicants and it, it gets confused because of the difference between the town manager appointments and the and the town council appointments. So, um, uh, I I think it would be helpful for us if we just got pulled into the communications with regard to any of the ones that are just town council appointments. So that just from the very get go we would be in on the communications. Of course, we can't be in on your telephone communication, but I guess you could just indicate on the spreadsheet um, if, you know, if we had gotten a spreadsheet that said the name of this person and that you'd had a conversation and that he or she had indicated um, th that they were fine with the other committee that they decided on um, be 
because I, I did see that there was one other applicant on the list too, uh, who it did not say on the spreadsheet that he or she withdrew, it said um, that they had taken another position. And maybe, maybe they had indicated that that was, that they didn't also want to be considered for this, but that just, maybe just more, more information on the spreadsheet. Um, and, and copying us on any, any communications, email communications or whatever, so that we can see what they're saying back to you. Um, does that make sense? I just want to let you know that for each candidate, that could be 22 emails, so prepare yourself. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think this is where, where we, these are things that as we're trying to figure this process out, there are some things that feel, seem sort of obvious and then they're not obvious and it's not something that we've made specific and then there's some things that seem like they would work and then in practice, like in theory, it seems like it would work and then in practice that it doesn't. So that's why I'm saying that I appreciate you coming in and telling us like what happened and then I think there needs to be a broader discussion of for town council appointments, what does town council expect and have they communicated that? So for a while I was wondering when everybody said, well, what was your pool, what was your pool, what was your pool? I am now understanding that the pool means something, it means something different to everyone. And so I think that the council needs to decide what, what do they consider the pool and, and what do they want to see for the pool names? And if they decide that it's every single person that, you know, even people that had, um, indicated that they were interested in anything or everything that, that they could be of service to, apparently it seems like that council is going to say that all those people should be in the pool. So that's, I'm just saying, so what I'm saying to you is, is thank you for what you've done and then council needs to decide what are the specifics, write it down, make it a procedure and then let you know so that it's clear Right, because we so can't I would, read your mind. I mean, Councillor you know. Dumont has just suggested that not just for town council appointments, but also for town manager. And the quicker we close that loop, no? No, I no. didn't say that. No, just no. town oh. council. Okay. Yeah, we don't have control over. So the quicker that we close that loop, the better, because it does. Even though I'm just CCing you, it does change the way that I function in terms of daily procedure. Right. That would be really helpful. Evan. So. Um, I think I want to make sure what what Darcy says isn't immediately Angela doesn't just take that as a directive from the committee before we discuss it because I also have some concerns about that and one of my concerns throughout this entire process has been with the ability to select multiple committees on a CAS some of which might be under the purview of the town council and some of which might be under the purview of the town manager there are times where we are seeing candidates for town manager appointed bodies when we shouldn't be because they are listed on the CAF. So because I was on the interview, uh, because I was the OCA designee for ranked choice voting, I saw all the CAS for ranked choice voting, right? And there were some people who selected committees uh, for that that were town manager ones. So now I know who's in the pool or a portion of that pool. And I also worry a little bit about being CC'd on every email because if someone selects planning board and affordable housing trust and Angela has a correspondence with them via email that's saying, well, what, do you, what would you rather do, planning board or affordable housing trust? And they go back and forth and we're watching this and eventually they come back and say, you know what, I think I'd rather housing trust. I'm not going to interview for planning board. Now we know that member of that pool. And so I think that it's not as simple as just being CC'd if some of the conversations are, well, which would you prefer if, and if there's a back Forth. Um, so I think that we need to be looped into the communication, but I, I'm a little worried about any town council appointment, any correspondence with any potential applicant being CC'd on. Um, and I think we need to I think we need to think about that a little more th thoroughly um, before we make a decision. Yeah. So I, maybe I wasn't clear. 
what I'm saying is is that thank you so much. Mm -hmm. This this shows us where we need to make improvement where things have not been clear and and also where council doesn't town town council doesn't doesn't necessarily know exactly how it wants to do that. So yes, anything we say here today is that's not law. We will absolutely write something that is very specific and communicate it to you so that there's not miscommunication, that there's clarity and that there isn't, you know, misunderstanding or frustration because we don't need that. So we will make sure that we get our act together and clarify a lot of these things and then we will we will write it down and we we'll absolutely like communicate it to you verbally and in writing so that it's it's easier and it's not so frustrating. Thank you, Angela. And and we'll write to Paul, not to you. You don't have to take the hits. <laughs> it's up to him to figure it out. So yes, Alyssa. So, so, the, so this has been really messy and we just found out about it at the end of last week's thing. And so there are a number of issues outstanding that I'm sure we can belabor at some length today, much to George's future <laughs> frustration. But right now, um, I want to be clear that I appreciate the way you phrase that, which is why I've really liked having you be chair because we know staff has been doing way more work with these appointments than they necessarily had to do before, right? And so the interview as part of this scheduled interview thing it was only a fairly recent select board phenomena. It wasn't for nearly as many people, right? Because we weren't having to fill whole committees. We didn't have yeah. so many open spaces when it first started, et cetera. And so it's really ramped up in terms of taking a lot of staff time. But also to be clear, I can't believe that if I polled the town council that they would expect that staff gets to take anybody out of our pool, ever. Like, that's just not a thing. I mean, I have no idea why it was assumed. I'm not blaming Angela. I have no idea why it was assumed by the town manager that that would be the appropriate thing to do. I mean, if somebody files a CAF, we should get the CAF. I mean, that it's just that simple. Then if that person later decides to withdraw or you know, finds out that the time, like, like Darcy pointed out, finds out the time in the meeting isn't going to work for them, they might withdraw before the interview, they might withdraw during the interview, they might withdraw after the interview. And I appreciate that conversation about how we get CC. So maybe one of another possible way of dealing with that, not that it's particularly easy either, is that that spreadsheet that she makes of her notes, which didn't include this person this time, which is why all of this frustration has arisen, is that that normally includes all this information if we could get that spreadsheet like regularly. Right, because then that's not email correspondence and it doesn't necessarily say anything about the other appointments they're looking for. She'd have to be more obscure perhaps in the way she wrote her note on her spreadsheet. But if we just got, and I mean we, meaning the whole town council, got that spreadsheet regularly that said who was still in the pool and who wasn't. But what I'm, one of the things we've expressed here several times is that we haven't been ever given the opportunity and we haven't figured out a way to wrestle that back in terms of we don't get to evaluate the size of the pool before we decide to schedule interviews. And mostly they've been time sensitive, right? So we've been, well, we're just gonna have to go with what we got because the charge says we gotta do this. But we've never been allowed to make that decision because we don't control the information flow. And similarly, We've not been allowed, so since we don't have the CAFs, we can't decide is that enough for this pool to go forward and to even start scheduling interviews. We don't even get the CAFs until after the interviews are scheduled or at least have started being scheduled. And so the practice was never gone over with us. Right. We were never given any input to it. So the fact that we're not clear on it is because decisions were made without us. That's why this happened. So I agree that we need to be clearer, but I refuse to take blame for the fact that we weren't clear to staff because we were never given a choice in any of these matters. We were just told this was the process we were gonna get. And in fact, we, didn't, we were never told the process will include us not telling you about people who withdrew. And that when I talk to them on the phone, I won't give you those CAFs. I understand that as a process, I get that it is a viable process the town manager likes, but it doesn't have anything to do with our process and we were get, never given the opportunity to discuss it that way. So I agree that we need to figure out 
what it, we think maybe one of the best ways is for us to come up with some ideas of what we could write down and then take that as a report to council and say, we think this is what you want, but we're not sure. Is this what you want to? Because no matter what our future process is with privacy and diversity and transparency, this is still a problem because it's always gonna come through staff. We're not gonna have people just like sending us individual emails to apply for things. I don't think that'll ever be our process. So I think having this larger conversation, even before we get into the big, how are we gonna revamp our process, is a really good idea with potentially dragging the rest of the council into it too so that they understand where we've been all along because I haven't been understanding that people are getting removed from the pool based on phone conversations prior to them getting to us. No, and so I should have been clearer on that. I mean, I, I think that this committee has made um, a point of saying out loud that the CAFs, the CAFs, once the select board had been dissolved, I don't know if it was before that, CAFs had automatically gone to right. the select board for them to see, but not to discuss. Once the select board was done and town council was appointed, the CAFs were, were stayed right with the town manager and that's where they were. And then for OCA to get them in the beginning, they were handed out to us from the town manager's office. That is how this, this began and this is what new counselors, this is, this is what we had. And again, we were, like you said, we were in a rush situation. This was just, this was how it was when we started. I don't know that, I, I know that this, that OCA itself never made that. We never said this is how we want it. We said we would like to, we would like to, we need to have them. But we also, we, in retrospect, now we know that we should have been clear on what the a pool was and that you know when we want to see them like that that is what needs to be corrected we're starting something out we didn't have an option in the very beginning now we need to be really really clear about what we want and and I agree with you that taking writing all this down and a timeline of when we get things and, and how much information we get to be something that we bring to the entire council and then bring it to the town manager yes is that clear George I'm still trying to understand what, maybe it doesn't matter, but what went wrong in this particular case. My understanding is that this was an applicant who, who in his CAF or her CAF had applied to many multiple member bodies or expressed an interest in many multiple member bodies. And in the course of the process, um, was interviewed and actually given an appointment. So do I understand this correctly? No? I, no I'm just trying to understand. I, I don't, uh, this is, maybe it's just, uh, so uh, he was simply removed, uh, or she, or he, or whatever, was removed from this process um, because uh, a member of staff, maybe somebody could explain it to me. Thank you. Evan? So there, there's essentially, um, within this actually two sort of issues that popped up, right? And so the first one was we should have seen this individual CAF in the pool regardless of whether they chose to interview or not, right? Because that's part of the pool. That it appears was simply a clerical error, that was a mistake, um, that that CAF never made it into our pool. The second issue was, was this person offered an interview? Um, and that seems to have been a miscommunication um, where uh, staff felt as though in discussing um, a prior committee appointment with this individual, that individual then withdrew from consideration for future committee appointments. Uh, that was not necessarily the impression of the individual and so I think there were two errors that occurred one was sort of clerical and one was a simple miscommunication and misunderstanding um, where uh, there was a conversation that occurred and there were sort of two interpretations of, of what came out of that um, so um, that that individual has now officially withdrawn from the pool um, to clear things up 
Soothing Advice Request by Angela. Has Angela told us that? Is that your question? No, that's, she's, sorry. I was turning to talk to him while you were talking, and then I heard it, so go ahead. So, okay, so this is what I'm going to say, is I think one of the issues is, is that we are saying that we would like to see the raw pool of people who applied. And then we need, if, if we agree that it is um, Angela or someone in staff who's the one who set up interviews, we are saying that we need to see every single person that applied and similarly to some notes that she has given us, we need to know when there was a phone call or an email and if this person decided to withdraw for whatever reason before they actually you know, got to interviews. I think there's also the discussion on the table of um, should we be the ones who are actually um, scheduling our own inter interviews and that we need to see the entire pool for two reasons, in the beginning, the whole entire raw pool for two reasons. One is so that we can see actually whether somebody withdrew or not, what do we have for diversity, how are we doing with outreach, and before we schedule any interviews, we need to take a look and say, you know, we have six, you know, uh, positions open, we have four people, or we have just six people. And we, before we go ahead, if you're the interview designee, you need to make the decision of whether or not you have a big enough or a diverse enough pool before you start interviewing because you have the right to say, I don't think this is big enough or diverse enough and there needs to be more outreach before we can even start delving into interviews. So I think that's another thing that we're, we're I believe I'm hearing and that we're trying to communicate. Evan? Yeah, so I think that our overall process has essentially two parts, right? So yeah. the first part is collecting CAFs, right? Establishing a pool, setting up interviews. Then the second part is interviews on. And that interviews on part has been the focus of our deliberations for the past six months, and also the focus of council deliberations and a lot of public debate as well. But that first part was never really, we right. never talked about, right? right? right. And, and Alyssa's right, it was decided for us, and in some way it was decided for us out of necessity, and in some part because we were so focused on part two of our process, which seemed more complex, that we were, and, and it didn't have sort of a default that we were willing to accept the default uh, for part one. What I think we're recognizing now is the default is, has some issues for us. And we only know they exist because we've gone through it. And a lot of times you have to go through a process to see its flaws. And so I think that I agree with what I think Alyssa said, which is before we get to what it, everyone expects will be a thorough debate of part two of our process, given what we've been through, we actually should start from the beginning. Um, and I, I certainly have some ideas on how we can improve that um, that I think might seem to complicate things on the surface but will simplify things down the road. Um, but I do, I do think that's probably a, a future discussion. Um. Thank you, Evan. Eliza. It occurs to me, and I... I understand that Angela can hang out with us all day because she's no doubt scheduling more interviews for other things, but in addition to her many other responsibilities. But as I hear more about what happened here, I think it's becoming clear, and, and, and I agree completely with what Evan just said, it basically in these two parts of our process, the before interview and the after interview. I think we all had a set of assumptions that I think actually pretty widespread across the entire council as to what was happening before and they were they are now proven to be false and those assumptions included the fact that if because we have seen notes that said people withdrew i now conjecture that we have there have been previous people pulled out of our pool before they ever showed up on a spreadsheet because they had that conversation before it was interview time. Right. So they put in a CAF in January, and then come March, they decided to move to Florida, and they called Angela and said, by the way, I'm not doing that stuff anymore. Stop asking me about general interest. I'm done. And so she had that person also been a finance committee person. Now that we were scheduling finance committee interviews in June, she just wouldn't have included them at all. 
So they wouldn't have been on the spreadsheet as applied, withdrew in February, moving to Florida. The only people that we're getting, I suspect now, having now heard a couple iterations of this, the only pe reason we're seeing some withdrawals is because those withdrawals were during, after that interview process, scheduling process started. So we have no idea, as you said, we used to have these automated distributions because that was shut off when the council started. We have no idea what the original pool was right. for anything. Right. The pool that we've been provided was a pool of a moment in time. And in fact, while it's not exactly relevant, I will bring up that I, in a conversation with the town manager, he mentioned that somebody applied after the interviews took place. And I said, well, that's really interesting because we've had other things in town where we've had closing dates, but we don't have a closing date for this. So what if you just happen to apply three days after? Well, we're not gonna go back and change our minds from the interviews, but what happens to that person? Like, how do we keep track of their new application? Like, it's understood, right, that they stay on file for two years, right? Because, <laughs> like, I'm just right. not sure about any of the process at this point. Right. And so I think those are just the kinds of things we need to enumerate, you know, and if somebody applies after we've made all the appointments and it doesn't look like we're gonna need another appointment for a year, we still need to make it clear to them that they'll be in the pool at some point and that even if they withdraw, which I guess does, does lead to the question of if somebody applies in January and then in February decides they're not interested in doing anything anymore for they now got a new job, whatever, do we still want their raw CAF, right? So whatever it might look like in the future. At what point is there a cutoff? And I guess my, my assumption is because it just seems much cleaner to me to just get it and then be told later they pulled out rather than picking some arbitrary moment in time at which it's no longer a viable CAF. But I don't know if everybody agrees on that, but I don't, it just seems complicated to me to try and pick a moment in time, but it appears that a moment in time has been chosen for us and that was never our intention. So I, I would agree with you on that. I'm also agreeing with Evan that there's a lot of things that we need to talk about about this before the interview process. I don't know. I mean, this, this sh should not have happened. <laughs> and, you know, it's, I think it, you know, it feeds into a lot of people's fears about whether or not, you know, their CAF is indeed seen by the appointing authority, where it goes, what happens with it. I mean, this is something that, you know, obviously we as town council members, we need to know what's going on. We need to be informed. And I, I would also say that most likely, I think that we're all saying we need more, not only do we need more control over it, and I think that also we need to know what's communicated to people. And, and to me, that also raises an, um, an issue about um, things being s spoken and not having a written record of it. And I know that when I called people for Planning Board and Zoning Board of Appeals, I also wrote an email and asked for a written response back so that I also had a written sort of receipt of the communication both, you know, I said per our, the conversation of our phone call on yada, yada, yada date you know, this is what I would like to see. So, I mean, that's something else. I don't know how deeply we want to get into this other than to say it never should have happened and it should never happen again and we all know that and so then there will be a deeper discussion of, of how we make sure as much as we can, right? And nothing is perfect, but that that doesn't happen again. Would we like to discuss? this further at this time? Or should we all be very clear that this is something that needs to be discussed soon and communicated to town council and then to the town manager? <laughs> okay, so nobody's, nobody's fired up to start discussing right now. We feel like we've discussed enough right just at this time. Yeah, or I, should I mean, we like to make a point? I, I think that this conversation could go on for a while. And I, I worry that last week the finance committee conversation got right. pushed back because we had so. Yeah. Um, Alyssa. So perhaps the segue then to the finance committee continued conversation is that 
it's not clear to me if this person has officially withdrawn or not. And if they haven't, and we believe that there is some, as has been portrayed, it appears that there was a difference of opinion on what was communicated, like you were talking about your receipts mm -hmm. issue, that I think we need to, there was a statement made that the person has withdrawn. I'm not clear if that's happened officially, and I don't know how we find that out, but that, to me, determines one of the conversations we're having about the, the proposed appointments is, are these the appointments we want? And if we have somebody that still wants to interview, not the person who applied after the fact, but the person we're speaking of, then that causes additional things with that. So I'm checking my email. Yeah, if, if we don't have by email, uh, proof of that, I mean, we can always do what we did last week, which is to pause briefly and find out uh, from Angela so that, that we could further our discussion on that, because you're right, I think that um, our further discussion about what to do about this in practical matters has to do whether or not this, whether or not this person still has requested or wants to be on a non, a resident non-voting member of the finance committee currently. Oh, Sarah. Darcy Angela did it's say that in her conversation with him that he stated that that he was um, he accepted being on or that one committee was as much as he could do or something like that. Um, so I think she was saying that, um, but that doesn't we di we didn't get anything By in right. But she seemed to be saying that he said to her that he was fine with the committee that he was uh, appointed to. So I, I'm just really, now at least two of us have done this. This is a private <laughs> application. We're referring to he, or maybe she, or he as the default. Can we just say applicant over and over again, please? Because this is not about that individual. No matter how we feel about that individual, it is about an error in the process that we're trying to fix. And I totally hear that that's exactly what Angela said, and that is not what the applicant said in a subsequent conversation. And so that, what I'm, what I'm trying to understand is then, if the applicant has since withdrawn, you know, just as this has played out. Because there were two issues here. One was that we thought a withdrawal would be documented, because we saw other withdrawals documented. It appears that there was no intention of, I mean, I, I'm not sure that it really was an oversight now, realizing more of this process, that maybe it was long enough ago that it wasn't even supposed to, sh quote, show up on our spreadsheet the way the process is working upstairs versus the way the process was working in our imaginations. So that was one issue, but the other issue was the miscommunication, which we all know any of us can have, right? I mean, we've all talked to people and walked away from a conversation thinking two different things happened. And so that still exists. So while it's true that Angela is utterly sure that that's what the conversation was, that applicant is not utterly sure that that's what the conversation was. And so till we figure out what that applicant has chosen as their path forward, then we can't make any offers one way or another if we don't know what they want. So. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So the, Angela had said that that was her understanding, which is why she didn't put that particular applicant. That's why she didn't put the applicant's application <laughs> forward to us and show that that applicant had withdrawn. So the question is, Now that the applicant, the applicant knows that their that their application was not put forward, the applicant had had expressed that they had wanted to be part of the pool. We don't know for sure at this juncture if that's been cleared up. Correct, Darcy. I, I can't help but wonder why this issue wasn't flagged when the CAFs came out, because this applicant's CAF was not in the pool of CAFs. So why didn't we flag it way back then? Because, because we didn't notice it. We, how, would we, how would we know? How would we know when we, we never received this person's 
as far as I know, there's CAF for this pool. How would we know to expect their CAF when the pool is completely private to us until we're given the CAFs? We wouldn't, I wouldn't know, um, but Evan flagged it um, when he saw the spreadsheet from, from Angela because he knows the applicant. So I'm just wondering why it wasn't flagged back when we got the CAFs. That's my flagging of it had nothing to do with the spreadsheet we received from Angela, and I didn't notice until I brought it forward to the committee. It's not like I noticed and held on to it. Something was said when someone realized there was an error, but I think that what you're saying in dismay is 100% true. Like, unless someone knows someone who applied, an applicant knows an applicant who applied for something, and that applicant says, Oh, you finished that? I had applied for that. I put in a CAF, and I, I never was contacted, and you never interviewed me. Like, that, that's why. That's the weird and completely inappropriate and unprofessional way that we found out that this applicant's CAF was not in the pool. So we need to make sure that that never, ever, ever, ever happens again. So it was flanked when... <laughs> It was a, a, a personal conversation where something came up, but it was flagged when, when it was. So yeah, it, it wasn't held on to. And right, this wasn't this wasn't a gotcha. This was a oh my sort of situation. And I think it had to be brought up because. If one, if this has happened to one person, then naturally town council has to wonder if it's happened again, and it's sort of also part of our responsibility. We have to make sure that it doesn't happen. George? So I would suggest we move on. Um, we have a conversation that we need to have at some point, but it's not today, so but, can we move on? But, but, but we have to decide today, George, if the pool that's been promoted, if, if the three applicants that have been brought forward are adequate, how can we... I'm not the one who said last time, how can we do that if we know that someone wasn't offered an application who, or an interview who thought they were going to be offered an interview? How, how can we just say, well, you know, we'll talk about it another time? It's in front of us right now. There are three people who've been brought forward. This person was not considered. So you had suggested, if I understood earlier, that we could stop for a moment and get an answer to that question? Did I understand? Somebody suggested that. Go ask. Hopefully, I won't be gone as long as that. Um, does the committee feel that's necessary? I mean, I don't see how we can act. If it, I mean, we could act on a hypothetical, but we don't know the answer. That's our problem. We don't know the answer. So, why don't we take a brief recess? Well, okay. it's up to the chair. All right, we'll take a pre brief recess. I don't even know if Angela will be up. All right, so this, this being private again, as which we were really attempting to take care of. So I will read an excerpt from this email that was sent to Angela. Hi Angela, it seems that it has come up as an issue so I wanted to share with you explicitly that at this time, having been appointed to, and I'm redacting that, <laughs> I do not think I would be able to serve on finance committee and therefore withdraw my application. Please feel free to pass this information along to OCA or whoever the appointing authority is. Thank you, Alyssa. So we know that this person has withdrawn their application, so that makes things a lot clearer. Okay. What, what was the date on that? Friday at 3.05 p.m. So moving on in this process of doing finance committee, we also have uh, Andrew Steinberg here who is chair of the finance committee and he has requested to speak to us today. So Andy, take it away. Okay, thank you and I will be very brief. Uh, and I wanna make, uh, start by saying that I am here as an individual counselor. I am chair of the com finance committee. I am not speaking on behalf of the finance committee. This has not been discussed or deliberated by the finance committee, so in no way could I be representing 
um, the committee and um, today. So I just want to make that clear. Um, I think that the um, concerns that I have is a couple of things. One, and it's generally as a counselor, um, more than as a uh, member of the finance committee or chair of the finance committee, though, to, though there are elements of that in my thinking too. Um, counselor, I uh, take very seriously, as do all of you, obviously, because of your service on this committee, the role of the council on things that are charged to the council for appointments, whether it be the planning board, the zoning board of appeals, or in this um, most immediate instance that you're talking about, the finance committee resident members of the committee. And in order to do that, um, we rely on um, your providing us with uh, assistance to help the thought process and to get us the information we need to do our job meaningfully. And I analogize that to what I hope that the Finance Committee is achieving in um, developing budget material and presenting it to you so that um, it, it assists you to do your work in um, a, adopting a budget for the town um, according to the terms of the charter. Um, it's not the Finance Committee's role to create a budget um, that, and, and finally approve it, it is the council's. And um, I, I think that we're all working together as committees to achieve that. Um, thinking that through then for the committee appointments um, that are council appointments, um, in order to um, do our work as counselors who are not members of the committee, we need some information, but we obviously uh, don't want or need all information because, uh, you know, that's why you exist, is to sort it out. And what I think is most important is that we know um, who applied, um, what was the um, recommendations, uh, who was interviewed, what were the recommendations? And in recommendations, um, not just uh, who was um, recommended and why they were recommended, but at least a sense of um, reasons that people were not recommended. And it's very delicate because, um, unlike the budget, you are dealing with people in people's lives and uh, there, there's some sensitivity that has to be applied, but um, it, it still um, becomes difficult when you know that very qualified people have a, more than the number of slots available have applied and um, it's impossible to get the thinking um, that we need without having a sense of um, both who is recommended and who is not recommended. And so it's a, it's a delicate balance. And I urge you to give some consideration as to how you're presenting that. Um, so that, that's part of it. The other thing that I wanted to touch on briefly in, in coming this morning is on the Finance Committee appointments in particular. And this is a really um, unusual and unique situation. I think we had a good discussion at the full council meeting about this. Um, because uh, it is the only committee that has people who are being appointed to the committee that are not counselors, at least at this point. We have no other. And, uh, you know, what should be the role of the finance committee in uh, being able to um, sort of properly assist in the screening and making sure that it works well for the functioning of the committee and assist the committee in the truest fashion. Um, and you have um, uh, recommended, or at least tentatively recommended, I understand that it's still a work in progress, but I've seen from 
the, the memo to some people um, and not and to, will ultimately not be recommending others. And um, you know, we, um, as a council, had made the decision that the Finance Committee would not be directly involved in the initial interview process. I am going to recommend to you and am going to recommend to the full council when I have the opportunity that um, the people who are ultimately recommended that um, the um, committee, or at least a member of the committee, the chair, or somebody have the opportunity to meet individually with the people who are being suggested so that we have an opportunity to tell them what our expectations are here from them and what, they're, what they think that they want to offer and um, what the skills that um, each in the knowledge that each of them brings forward. And uh, I think that is an important part of a process that is so unique that um, we're trying to have the council appoint people to work with committees. We want that to be a positive experience for um, the committee process as a whole as well as for the people who are participating on it. And I guess there's one other thing that I wanted to mention, and um, I, you know, it's obviously because it was an open meeting and I voted and we all voted. Um, I, you, you know that I was not um, um, in favor of the um, end results that were suggested for the planning uh, board and uh, council made its decision, which of course is what the we as a council, 13 of us are to do. Uh, but um, the one thing that um, came up was is that I spoke very strongly, as you know, about um, an individual who is not being appointed, who is an applicant, and there was a question of term limits and how long that person um, had served on the committee and whether that was uh, a reason not to continue their appointment or to continue their service because of the knowledge that they had. Um, and I bring this up because there's one applicant um, who I know very well. I worked with her um, and it's Mary Lou. I'm not going to beat around the bush. Uh, Mary Lou was on the um, old finance committee as a member when I was chair of that committee, and I worked with her very effectively as in that capacity. I worked with her very effectively as a select board member when she was chair of the finance committee that we had a number of things that involved both boards working together. So she's somebody I know quite well and work with quite effectively. but. Um, when you get into the question of why were there term limits um, as an issue for planning board and when is the time to say thank you for your service um, but your years of expertise while very valuable are something that um, is not a, um, quite a dispositive factor and there are other factors of needing to bring new people into governance that um, in the way that uh, Mr. Spitzman's um, application was considered and ultimately decided that um, I urge you to um, at least consider why that came up and whether that applies to other situations. And um, uh, it's again, it's not about Mary Lou, the decision of the council is that um, she be appointed, I think that she has a lot to offer, but I do think that there is a need for consistency and I hope you'll take the opportunity to consider that. So those are the things that I wanted to share and I appreciate all of the work you're doing and I appreciate your giving me the opportunity to just share that with you. Thank you, Mr. Steinberg. Evan? Uh, given that Mr. Steinberg is here today as a member of the public, are we allowed to engage in discourse? No, I Thank you. don't 
Alyssa? I'm going to just, I'm going to ask the chair to reconsider that because he's not engaging as a member of the public because he's not here for public comment. He was, he asked to come and speak specifically about, it was my understanding, sorry I wasn't there, but it was my understanding he offered to come and speak about finance committee, either process or candidates. It was not put off to public comment, which as our other audience member well knows is always at the end of our meeting. So I don't think this is public comment. I think this is theoretically a place where we may choose, if you allow, Chair, for us to have some discussion. But you can obviously no, that's, limit that's, it by time or no, that's, whatever. That is uh, absolutely fine. In fact, I would like to, to, to begin. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so the way the process is now is that all of town council will know who applied because you get all of the CAFs. We've, of course, just brought up a little bit that we need to talk about how the, the pool is actually put together, sure. but essentially right now you have those. Um, when our recommendations, OCA's recommendations, come to the entire town council, you will also receive, and you have received in the past, the entire interview schedule that was put together by Angela. I wanted to make it very, very clear that when an interview designee goes to do interviews, we have very carefully set up checks and balances. One of the checks and balances is that the interview designee does not just send their recommendations on to the town council. First it comes here and then OCA has the conversation of whether or not we feel that the applicants that have been brought forward are the ones that we feel are suitable. So there, there's never, there, there is that check and balance. Just because applicants are brought here does not mean that OCA will then bring the applicants that were originally brought forward to town council. So I want to make that very, very clear that when town council, you know, if they do, you know, read a memo that a designee has sent, that that does not mean that that is our final decision, nor do we, we rubber stamp and interview designees' decisions. Um, I also will say that town council itself as a whole has exhaustively talked about and OCA itself has talked about um, whether or not to discuss applicants, especially their names, if they have not been brought forward. It is the thinking of OCA that we don't, we will not bring up names of applicants who have not been brought forward. And I believe that in, we can have further discussion on that. Is part of that is the thought that um, then it leads to the idea that you are saying, you know, I saw A on the list. A wasn't brought forward. I want to talk about A, which. I think OCA has decided that that's not appropriate. So one of the things that I think that that also leads to is the fact that if that does happen, if we if we do start talking about people whose names have not been brought forward, then in, in my estimation, then the full council or even OCA is actually doing what it says, well, maybe uh, it didn't need to, which is, well, we don't need to redo the entire process that OCA has already done. I believe that what that actually says is that either you know, if Oka would like to, you know, brings that up, you know, I saw A and A wasn't brought forward, I want to talk about A, or if the full town council does, then people are actually saying, yes, we do want to start this entire process over. We don't necessarily um, trust the information that you had, and we would like to have all the information. So in my mind, that that is not part of our process, when we are looking at the process again, we can, we can ask ourselves, what OCA can say, do we think that this is true? Do we believe that we want to change this so that the entire process is open to the entire council so we can have that kind of, people can be in interviews, all of us, and that we can all make a decision together. Um, but I don't think that that's where we're at right now. So that's all I had to say about it, and I will open it up to further discussion. Evan? Thank you. And so thanks for being here and some of the points you brought up, I, I also intended to bring up. Um, but one of my questions um, f 
for you since you are here is when you and Kathy uh, came to us uh, about a month or so ago, um, there was a question about the meeting time and whether or not their ability to meet between 2 and 4 p.m. on Tuesdays was sort of a litmus test. Would, would you eliminate a candidate if they didn't have that option open? And my recollection of the answer, although it could be blurry, um, was that it was not exactly, we wouldn't necessarily eliminate someone just because they couldn't meet during that time. Um, if you were looking at the report that the OCA designee put forth, there's a sentence in here that says, it was unfortunate that some applicants withdrew based on the necessity of having to be available from 2 to 4 p.m. on a weekday. And so it, it appears in the end that that was sort of a litmus test. You can't be on the committee if you can't meet during this time. Um, it's clear that you see people in the CAS who you think were qualified, and I, and I have to question whether they might fall into that category of would be perfectly qualified but not available on Tuesdays from 2 to 4 p.m. Um, and this, this whole, this part makes me uncomfortable. Um, to some extent, people need to be able to be available when a committee meets, right? I mean, we wouldn't have appointed someone to planning board um, if they couldn't meet when planning board meets. At this other side, most of the town committees, not all, but a good number of them meet in the evenings. Um, finance committee currently meets during the day when many people are working a nine to five job. And, and using that as a litmus test might necessarily exclude anyone who doesn't have that flexibility in their schedule. Um, and I also want to recognize that town council committees are still sort of young and there's probably some flexibility. Um, and so I do have some concerns that there were perhaps good applicants who were not considered and who had to withdraw because they couldn't make what is a very inconvenient time slot for working people. And so I'd love to hear, as chair of finance, your, your thoughts on that. Well, thank you. Um, actually, I was not at that meeting. Kathy was at the meeting, I believe. But in any event, I am aware of what she said about scheduling, uh, which is what you're raising as a question. Uh, I think I would have to go back to the committee and present this issue to the committee, not pertaining to names, because I actually don't even know which individuals you're referring to. but. Um, it is correct that we came to the time that we did after having discussions with the members of the committee who were then members of the committee as those counselors and uh, we're trying to work around one member of the committee who has a teaching schedule um, in, in addition and uh, we, we came to an accommodation of the, the meeting time that works best for all but I don't think we gave serious consideration to nighttime meetings. I think that there was just generally a feeling of exhaustion more than conflict um, that caused that decision to be made. But um, if it was represented that there were qualified applicants who could not be considered because of our meeting time, that would actually be new information for the discussion at the Finance Committee, and I would be glad to take that to them. Um, and, uh, and so that's helpful, thank you. So I just wanted to say that being there at that time, um, there was a member of the Finance Committee here who was our president, and my recollection is that she said that right now that time had to be, maybe sometime in the future could be changed, but she felt that that um, people who applied need, needed to stick to that schedule. So we would have to go back to minutes for that, and I'm wondering if anybody else recalls one way or the other. I only remember uh, Kathy responding to that question with the idea of they should be there, but I, I believe I asked directly, do we have to disqualify anyone automatically who can't meet between two and four on Tuesdays, and the answer I remember receiving was no, we wouldn't automatically disqualify them. But it does look like they were either by the designee or they self-withdrew um, from that. But I, I just, I do have some concerns with that, especially the Finance Committee has historically met at night, right? And so it was a little bit more accessible. Um, 
and I believe also tomorrow isn't finance committee meeting at 9.30 in the morning? Yes. Um, and those, those um, that change is because, uh, you know, you can go ahead and use names, it's <laughs> no purpose not to. Dorothy teaches at um, Holyoke Community College, and uh, now that we're in a different season of the year, um, where she has a different teaching schedule because she's on the summer schedule, uh, we could meet tomorrow at 9.30 and accommodate all members of the committee, and that was the best time to do so. And um, so we did make that switch for that purpose. The question of evening meetings, um, you know, I, can, I will bring this up tomorrow as uh, an item not anticipated 48 hours in advance and uh, just see what kind of response and uh, I will advise the chair um, after the meeting as to what, our, what the discussion was about it. Darcy? It's also in the handout that we provided for all the interviewees. The, the finance regular meetings take place on Tuesdays in the town room, normally from two to four. So. Oh, so. Exactly, Th thank you for finding that, Darcy. People automatically didn't apply because of that litmus test, because you wrote that litmus test. You may not have intended it as seriously as it was taken by the candidates, but that's what a prepared candidate actually read in terms of what to do. I just, I just want to follow up on that because we did, I would argue that finance committee is unusual, absolutely, in that finance committee was already given way more influence in this process than any other committee has been given. And I grant you, it's a town council committee. But at the same time, planning board and ZBA, all we asked, all we allowed them to do was to give us characteristics to look for as you were, as the OCA designee was evaluating people. Instead, finance committee, we said, we will take questions that you write that are different than our questions. We will let you write a handout that includes your specific meeting time, which causes people to take themselves out of the running, either reading that ahead of time or during the meeting. So we've done all those things. And as you indicated, there was a four to nine vote that this process was the process we were using. And so obviously you are welcome to bring up any alternatives to this process at this point, but I can't understand why finance committee needs any additional special treatment over what finance committee has already received. I agree that it's unfortunate that if you weren't adamant about the time period that people took themselves out of the running, but I also just think it is realistic that of course you have to work with the counselor's schedules. I mean, it, you don't have a choice. I mean, we've run into that with all the different committees we're all on. It is strange, and I pointed, I remember pointing that out to our yes. president, that it is strange that mm -hmm. so many of our meetings are during the day now, because that's mm -hmm. not very accessible to working people. But at the same time, it's also trying to make the working people on the council's schedules work. So I totally get that finance committee had to do what it had to do to make it work for finance committee. But I don't think it makes any difference at this point to say, well, well, maybe we're more flexible than that because we already cut people out of the process with the handout you gave us to give to them. We didn't write that, we wrote that handout for planning board and ZBA. You wrote, the finance committee wrote that handout for us to use here because we wanted to be clear that because this was a council committee, we were trying our best to include the finance committee as best we could given that the process we have, we can't have two counselors involved in the interviews. And I find it, that all being said, it will not surprise anyone that I find it extremely objectionable, the idea that we would make a recommendation to town council as OCA, as we have been with everything else, and then the finance committee would say, yeah, so refer that to us so that one of us can meet with the person or we can ask them to come to our meeting. I just find that bizarre, but that's a different conversation, right? When it comes up at town council, we'll deal with it then. So I would also like to say that yeah, the time was discussed and we all knew that there would be a handout that would be put out to everyone, you know, saying what time each committee met and my understanding is, is yes, that it was in the handout and that people do make decisions on that. I had people who took themselves off of, you know, uh, zoning Board of Appeals because of the set time. Um, it's 
it does seem a little unusual to me that finance committee set this time, and I, I do specifically remember our president saying that this was important, at least for now, that this was the time that was kept, as all it could change later, um, that we would, we would go back and say, hey, well, you know, maybe we could be f flexible. I mean, I guess we, I guess we could, but it, it also seems odd because then it almost seems like, well, we're saying that there were people that weren't brought forward that maybe, you know, we really want to consider. And so do you want, do you understand what I'm saying? Like that, it seems a little strange. Like we could, Andy could bring that to the finance committee. They could decide on time because I do agree with Evan that a lot of, of committees that have residents, they need to meet at a time that people are not working. But it also seems a little um, strange in, in some ways. So, Andy? Yeah. Um, it's my understanding that people who chose to apply for the committee um, were operating off of uh, a general announcement that we were looking for citizen members to participate in the committee, resident members to participate in the committee, but that uh, the time was not a factor in that initial announcement, so people made a choice to apply, and then this question of the time arose later in the process and then caused some people to be um, apparently not um, considered. And, I, and so I don't think it's too late to go back and um, obtain that information and then to get it to you to consider um, because it's not, nobody didn't apply because of the time, um, the time screening happened after. Um, so I guess that was one thing is far as uh, the point about um, doing it, uh, meeting with people, which is not a part of interview process, it's really no different than if uh, people were, are recommended for, say, the planning board, because that was the other rec uh, thing that we, another committee we've dealt with, and uh, a member of the council on their own made a phone call or had personal knowledge and that it was outside of the interview process either before the evening before and contributed that to the discussion, that ha can happen. I don't think there's anything that um, the council has said that would not allow that to happen. Uh, it would be seems like unusual. Um, so, uh, I, I, I guess that I don't see what the problem that the council should have if there are three people who are recommended and a member of the committee itself feels it's appropriate to do so, uh, wanted to have that call, uh, wanted to make calls and just say what were, what, what is it that you think you have to contribute Here's what we're thinking. Um, you and give them, have a, a really informed discussion. Um, I think it would enrich the process, not detract from the process, and I don't think it's inconsistent with the process. So um, the first thing I would say is that OCA does screen by time. And we ask every single committee when you meet, and one of our interview questions is, is do you understand the time commitment that um, is required and the work commitment that is required for this committee and the committee meets at blah 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 time. And we do screen by that because if somebody says, I can't come, then we say, sorry. I mean, that's something that we talked about. So I, I'm not saying that we, you know, we, we, you know, you couldn't ask, but I wanna make it very clear that the interview designee screening by time was not unusual. As far as I know, we all did. We, we all did that. Did you, I don't know if there's anyone who. If someone says, if we say planning board meets at seven o'clock on a Friday, can you meet on seven o'clock on a Friday? And they say, no, I would need you to change your schedule. I'm just wondering, my understanding was that we wouldn't say, oh, you can, you're a fabulous candidate. I can talk to the rest of the planning board and I feel like they could change their time. That's really what we're saying. 
And though I know that this is a new finance committee, what we were told was this is the time we meet, this is what meet, this is what works for us. We need to keep this for a while. And if, if people cannot come right now or the way it is, we, we can't do that. We do screen by time and, and date. We do. If you can't make a, a meeting time, when it's an established meeting time for five other people, Melissa. Yeah, I mean, just following up on that, yes, I do understand this is a council committee. At the same time, I can't tell the planning board, oh, you could have had this fabulous candidate if you would all be willing to switch your meeting time, which involves not only those people, but also st because they have significant staff support, unlike all council committees, they have significant staff support because of the legal things that they do. And I'm not going to go to the planning board and say, by the way, you could have had somebody really good, but you should change. Like, that's not, we can't do that. It's and so to do that now seems really weird, especially given that, you know, I mean, unless we started the whole thing over again, I mean, there were people who saw that handout. There were also people, even before handouts existed, which is something we added to this, who could actually look and see all the posted meetings. Huh, I can't go to those times. I'm not going to bother to apply. Not everybody applied in December. Some people applied more recently once meetings actually started taking place. And they looked at the schedule and said, that's not going to work for me. I mean, that, that's all of our practical reality, right? Is that unless you're starting a brand new thing, you really can't be the one that comes in and changes the meeting time, unfortunately. Right. So that, I guess that's what I want to say is that that is the practical reality. So that is something to keep in, in mind for finance committee, you know, and if indeed you want to say that we meet every Friday at, at 7 p.m., then that would be something that people would know, but I, I don't know that anyone could actually apply for a committee not knowing when they would have to be there, because subsequently they could work a night shift and have to be gone by 9 when that's the time that the meeting, so people need to know when a regular meeting is, 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 is what I'm saying. So if finance committee wants to say, nope, we all agree that we're going to start meeting Wednesday nights at 6.30 p.m. and that's what we tell people, but you have to tell people what time, and I, I do think that that, if I had a job and I met at 6 p.m., I had to go to work at 6 p.m. and that's usually when meetings were, I wouldn't say, well, I'm gonna apply and then see what happens. Maybe they could meet at a different time. So I'm only coming this up from a practical sense. And yeah. it, it'd be Real quick about the response on this, um, I don't think that any of us on the council would disagree with what you're saying, that you, the committee, once it has a time, that that is a factor in their availability. Also, I'm, um, also I'm saying is, is that um, we're in a new process. The Finance Committee um, did not have a strong conflict, it was sort of the preference type of thing about not meeting at night, uh, that if the um, information came that there would be more candidates who would have been considered had the time availability been uh, greater, would in get feedback from the committee as to how they'd react to that. It seems to me that would be useful information. It is actually very helpful that we're having this discussion without my having any knowledge of who the candidates were who said that I can't meet at night because I'd rather not know that and have the discussion uh, because I really think it's a principled discussion than not a uh, around specific candidates. But the other factor is, is that if we got down to the point where you only had three people left because um, of the time constraints, I think that is a real concern. Where are we heading with this? I'm not clear. Evan. Since I brought it up, I can, I can speak to that, right? And so, we have a difficult process as OCA because we cannot bring up names who are not recommended, right? And so if there are people whose caps I see who are not in this recommendation who I feel should be qualified, I cannot say, why wasn't so-and-so 
recommended. What makes that more difficult for me is the statement in the report that says that some candidates withdrew because they couldn't make the 2 to 4 p.m. time slot. And so my immediate question in my head is, are these people who I'm seeing as good candidates not here because they couldn't make that time slot? Right? So that's, that's my question. And I, I can't really ask that question, which is the unfortunate part of our process. Because if there are good people who couldn't make that time slot, then I go back to what my impression was, and it sounds like perhaps I was mistaken, of our conversation with finance over do we disqualify people who can't make a meeting time. I understand we would never ask planning board or ZBA to change their longstanding meeting time for a candidate. But my impression also was that finance committee was a bit more flexible. And in case we're seeing this flexibility, as one of their members is now on a summer schedule, and so they're changing their meeting time, right? And so here we're saying always meets 2 to 4. They have to meet 2 to 4. But tomorrow, they're meeting 930 because they have the flexibility to change to accommodate one member. And if there is flexibility in finance committee, then it would make me uncomfortable if someone withdrew who would have otherwise been a really good candidate because they that was interpreted as a hard, cannot be changed time. So, Darcy, I, I think this is a completely, this was a completely foreseeable problem. Um, and we would definitely foresee that there would be people that would not be, who would withdraw because of the time. So, um, I'm kind of flummoxed as to why we're spending so much time on this when we knew all of this beforehand, and this, this is a super predictable problem. So I, you know, um, I feel like we should um, move on. So one thing I'm gonna say is that one of the things that we've talked about is consistency, and I harp on that all the time. Um, What I will say about this is the way this is being presented right now, um, I think suggests that what people are saying is, um, it, it, but this is what it sounds like. It sounds like if everybody had agreed that the three applicants were the best, we wouldn't be arguing about time. I feel like I understand that, you know, that what you're saying is, well, now, you know, maybe things could be more flexible with finance committee, maybe they didn't nail it down, um, we, could, we could look at other people, but it also semi smacks of saying, I'd really like to look at other people and maybe we could be flexible now. That's what I'm gonna say, I feel like that this is what it's gonna look like on the surface. What I will say is that finance committee wants to ask their members and wants to nail down a time. I would say that that's, what I would like to see for consistency. Finance committee would have to say we meet at this time. If they're not willing to say that they're meeting at one time every week all the time, then, you know, then I would say please put on your charge or what you're gonna have us send to, or you're gonna say to people who are interviewing that right now time is up in the air. So if you, you know, if you want it, you can take it. You know, and then, you know, we're very flexible, we're very fluid, finance committee doesn't meet on a certain time every week. You know, we sort of work around people's schedules and that's what we could tell people. But I, I think that in the future, we need to make sure that when we're writing down and presenting a meeting time to people who, applicants who are interviewing, we need to be specific on that. Does that, does that make sense, Evan? I, so I, I agree with, everything you said in the latter half of your statement. I'd want to make my position very clear based on what was just said. My concern over this time has nothing to do with the people who were put forth. In fact, when I first read this report, I read the process part first because I had some questions. And I saw that line, and it immediately triggered the conversation that we had had. So Darcy's comment of, this was foreseeable, I agree, which is why I brought it up in our, what, what meeting is this? 513 on May 13th I asked finance committee that question because I foresaw this problem so I, you know this isn't something I'm thinking of now and my statement was is this a litmus test because if so we are de facto disqualifying anyone who works a 9 to 5 job and if that's what we're doing if we're saying no one who works 9 to 5 can serve on finance 
then we can say that, right? And my impression was that wasn't what we were saying at the time. So uh, yes, this was foreseeable. I brought this up well over a month ago. And my concern with this has been from the beginning, it's not just in response to the names that were put forth. So I think the quandary also is that the fact that we asked Finance Committee to write something and this is the time that they wrote. So what I'm going to say is, again, I'm not saying that what this outward impression is is true. I'm just saying I feel ginky because it, it could look this way to people. And I, I would say that then we therefore have to say to all chairs of committees, you know, if this is the time you meet, we need to know, even if it's, hey, we're really flexible, it could be any time. That needs to be very clear at the very beginning. Andy? Yeah. Um, I appreciate the conversation. We are in a learning process as a council. In all of our committees are in the learning process because we've just not done this before. Um, what happened in May, a discussion that happened in May was not a good time for the Finance Committee because we were meeting twice a week and trying to complete a report on what is the major task of the committee with the June 1st deadline. And uh, so the timing that it apparently came up may have interfered with being able to get it back to the committee uh, from the two members of the committee who were apparently involved in the prior discussion. And, that's just part of this unfortunate learning process. Darcy? Pardon? I, I wasn't sure if you were going to say anything. Did you want to? No. Alyssa? So, right. I mean, applicants need to know some vague idea of a meeting time, even if it's flexible. That's still true. It's unfortunate that this communication worked out the way it did for all the various reasons we've discussed. But there is. You know, even though we're talking about a much different process in the future, the process we have right now involves us at OCA evaluating three people. If it turns out mm -hmm. those three people can't meet at the same time the Finance Committee can meet, then like we're kind of wasting our time. Right. So we need to be clear on just what the level of flexibility is so people either don't take themselves out of the mix or leave themselves in the mix so they can make that decision. I do want to touch on the fact that because Andy was kind enough to give us the heads up, I'm sure he wouldn't characterize it this way, but I will characterize it this way, that some members of the Finance Committee don't trust the OCA process, that now we know that this is going to come up again at Town Council, even though mm -hmm. we've talked about it numerous times at Town Council on how to vote about it, and so now there's going to be another discussion about it. And so I think part of where we're going with this, Darcy, is that at some point we'll want to discuss what our response to that is, right? So rather than it being a surprise the night that it comes up at town council and Oak has not had a chance to discuss it since we know it's in the air, we could arguably talk about that next time we meet because we're gonna run out of time today. But the other part that I wanted to ask about, because we wanna be prepared for that conversation around the same, well, speaking for myself on OCA, I believe this. It's like, if we know there's a proposal in the air, we ought to be prepared to speak to it. So that's useful information. The other thing I wanted to ask about on a completely different note is that given that we have a member of the Finance Committee here, given that we gave the, the Finance Committee the opportunity to write questions, to write the handout, to talk to us about things, given where we are with the Finance Committee, I believe I've probably made it clear in the past that I think the idea of non-voting resident members on this committee was a stupid choice to put in the charter. I'm not going to characterize it any other way. It was stupid. And I understand the theory behind it in terms of, oh, well, there might be experienced finance people. Yeah, those are called staff members. That's what you have for that. And then you also elect people who know something about finances. The idea that somehow we're going to find the magic right fit, given the timing of the meetings, of non-voting residents is really frustrating to me. I find this very unsatisfying to try and make this match up. I'm especially concerned that if one of the points, if not the only point, of putting it in the charter in the first place was to help the town council who might be substantially new at doing finance. Well, guess what? The town council's done, the finance committee's already done a budget process. I mean, we're in the throes of it right now. So having somebody with 25 years of experience in town, in town meeting finance committee no longer seems especially relevant to me. I'm not sure I would, if we had done this in February, right, if a whole lot of things were different, <laughs> if we'd done this in February, I could see more purpose to saying, oh my gosh, we're still early, you know, relatively early in the process, 
let's bring in some old finance committee members, some of which probably were coming to meetings anyway, and put them on this. Now that there's been a cycle, I'm not sure I any longer see substantial, I'm not talking about the individuals, who are, all of which I've worked with, it's the ones that were on finance committee before. I'm not sure I see the purpose anymore of leaning on that expertise, and so while we have a finance committee member here, I just wonder if they've had a chance to talk about that because of where we are in the process. Because I know we had to realize at town council at some point that something had to give, and this was one of the things that gave, is that we didn't rush and try and get this one done the way we had to rush to get others done. Darcy? I think I would have to say that um, uh, I definitely think there's a reason for, for the non-voting members of the Finance Committee, and I, I wish that they had been kept uh, at four instead of three, and that I think that uh, what we're sometimes losing in this whole process is the intent of the, of the charter authors in putting this in, I, you know, I'd be really interested to hear from the charter commission members who wanted to put this in what their intent was for these resident members. Because um, on the one hand, they can be uh, giving their expertise and sharing it with the finance committee as far as helping them along. But another reason may very well be that they want residents there to be able to be asking good questions about the town manager's budget um, with whatever they're interested in. So really, you know, representing residents in the finance process. I'm guessing that that was probably the reason that they were included. So we've already heard from the Finance Committee and we've heard from the Town Council President and I believe that the people who have written this have also weighed in and from what I understand and I believe are in our minutes is that the, 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 non, the resident non-voting members of the Finance Committee were actually there to aid in the work of the Finance Committee. So I will just, as Alyssa said, since we have someone from Finance Committee here, would you like to speak to that, Andy? I, th I do not know what was in the minds of the um, Charter Commission in making it as a possibility. I think it was, um, in, as I look at the Charter, there are some things they put in there that you shall do this, and there are other things like rank choice, and rank choice voting is one of them. I think that it's an expectation that we will do that. Uh, participatory budgeting is a decision that the council will make after getting a commission recommendation as to what a process would look like, uh, but we're not required to do that, and this was in that category. Um, I think we're in a learning process. They gave us the option. Um, we made a decision very early on as a council to go ahead and um, to do that and put it into the committee charge, whether we would do that now and revisiting it is a different question. And I don't, you know, it's really a council decision that would have to be made uh, as to whether to uh, not continue that process. Uh, I don't think it belongs to any of the committee. Okay, so this is this is what I'm hearing, is that I, <laughs> when we discuss this charge, and we discussed the terms. Um, council itself had said this is what they want. When we asked the finance committee, "What do you see the the role of resident non-voting finance committee members?" We were told explicitly that they were not to be. They were to be people who were already up to speed, and that they were to be helpmates. And that's what we needed to keep in mind. That that is what I know. When we asked Finance Committee to write their handout and give us a time and a meeting time, we were not told you could put any old time, although I, I realize what Evan says is that, you know, we reluctantly, uh, I, I believe that Kathy did say, well, well no, you know, we, we, we could, you know, consider something else, but here's the time that was, that was put there. Um, So what I'm hearing now is that people are saying, well, maybe we, maybe we don't, maybe council should reconsider whether we want these people 
maybe maybe um, fin the finance committee wants to decide and reconsider what time they meet. Um, and I find this a little confusing and also somewhat frustrating. And um, I would imagine that we did screen by time. So at, at this point, I, you know, I don't know how much more discussion is actually going to be fruitful because I think we're all dancing around the fact that perhaps people don't want any of these. You know, we haven't even gotten to discuss names, but my, my, my feeling is here with the discussion that's being had is um, people want something else. And I would say at this point, do we need to have a vote on whether or not we allow finance committee to pick a different time or say that it's a different time? Do we want to have a vote on whether or not we go back to the very beginning? Do we want to have a vote or discuss whether we should bring the whole idea of whether or not we should have resident non-voting members even on? What, what are people actually saying? What is, my, what is my committee saying to me? I don't think we can change the charter. We can't. I mean, the full, the full, you know, the full council, right? Evan. Well, of course, we can't change the charter. We could, change and I'm not, charge. I'm not saying, right. I'm not saying that we, or the charge, and I'm not saying, we, this is not me advocating for that, but we, in theory, could send a recommendation back to the council that says, we've discussed and we actually don't think there should be non-voting members. That would be a weird thing to do. We, we have a proposal in front of us. We have a recommendation in front of us. It feels to me as though we probably should discuss the recommendation and vote on it um, since it's in front of us. But you're right, there are like a number of issues that we are sort of dancing around that none of which have a clear resolution and it might just be that in the end, that's part of our report to the count. I imagine this is gonna be a lengthy report given that we've spent more meetings on finance committee than on any of the other committees we've appointed as far as the actual recommendations. Um, and maybe these things are just put forth um, to, the, to the council in our report regardless of what the vote is at the end. Alyssa? I guess I'm, I, don't, I don't want to mischaracterize what you said, Evan, but I guess I'm leaning toward a sort of hybrid report, too, depending on how our discussion of the three candidates turns out, <laughs> the three candidates we keep not talking about, um, is that we could make a recommendation either way at this point and still say we had this lengthy conversation where we realized the timing's different, the timing in terms of what people's expectation for what the, the role these people would play, there's still a difference of opinion on what role these people would play, and there's still the question of could more time be accommodated. I just do want to be clear for everyone out there in TV land that the charter says may include members of the public. So the town council could vote to remove them from the finance committee charge. Yes. There's absolutely no obligation to have them accept that early on, as Mr. Steinberg said we made a decision to include them because why not include people? Of course we're gonna include people. It's just that as time has wound out, it has looked a little different. But I think that our report can cover all of these issues no matter what we decide about these three candidates because we have questions and we might not necessarily come to a resolution on a recommendation for either people or process, but we can reflect all that in our report so that town council doesn't feel like they have to relitigate perhaps every single aspect of it at the meeting. Because to some extent, some of this might just have to be thrown to the council. So I've made a, quite a scene about the time today, right? <laughs> um, and I recognize that. And so we could, in theory, put forward these names to the council. But with that discussion, finance committee could discuss this tomorrow, and the five members of finance could come back and say, "Well, hold on," you know. And then that, then the council can, in the end, say, "Well, maybe we need to go back, right? Refer this back." Um, I think as long as we're accurately reporting the debate we had, and, it, and we're fortunate to have uh, Andy here today with us because then he can relay this conversation back to finance in their meeting so that on our July 1st meeting, they might come back with, with something to say as well. So in here, and I, I, I would agree with you, Evan, so I, I, I'm going to say this and then we can have discussion if anyone thinks that I'm incorrect. I would then, with the discussion that we have had today, um, you know, we can take a vote on the, the 
people that have been brought forth, but then I would then ask um, Andy to bring to his meeting tomorrow two questions. One is about the time of, of meetings, and the second would be whether or not Finance Committee at this point, having already gone through a budget cycle, now still does feel that they would like to have three resident, non-voting members on Finance Committee. I think that those would be two things that end when the Town Council decides to elect these people or, or, or appoint these people or not would be, is that what we're saying? Is that's Alyssa? With the caveat that with that second question, the timing one's easier, surprisingly, yeah. given how much time we've spent on it. But do they still need these three people and what do they mean by that, yeah. right? Because that's the difference. It's right. like, what do they need them for? Because what they right. need them for should actually, because we could be, despite all our work with Finance Committee, who we worked with much more closely than we have any other body, we may not be picking the people Finance Committee would pick based on what they believe they need right now. And so I get that that's super awkward, but if they have a strong opinion about that, that does feed into our whole shebang, right? Just like if we hadn't had this long discussion, we could have made a decision today, taken it to council and Finance Committee members could have each voted against it and said, go back because we don't think you understood the criteria. That can always happen. So, I mean, we can do that. And but I want to be really, really clear at this point that when, when we sent Darcy out to interview these people, Finance Committee gave us when they met. Finance Committee did sit in front of us, two members of Finance Committee, and say explicitly what we are looking for is people who are already up to speed who can aid us. That is what we were told. And the number and the term length were also explicitly clear. <laughs> so Darcy did, uh, Darcy did her job with every single thing that the Finance Committee and OCA gave her. Um, I, I will say that I feel a little bit flummoxed that any of these things <laughs> came up right now, but it's not my decision. If Oka believes that these things, if, if we, so I do feel flummoxed. So I'm hearing that people, even though we, we have this information, we had this information, Darcy did her job, I'm hearing that, that Oka would would be open to as part of our report and as part of the further conversation and helping town council make its decision that we would like to ask Andy to bring back to his committee for um, discussion and then a final decision to bring to town council what times they meet. Do they feel that they still need want these three members? And then the third question is, now, having been through a budget cycle, what do they think the role now is of these three people? Acknowledging that these are all things that we knew that now are changing. Correct? These I'm are not, things, yes. I'm not sure why we have to act on this. The Finance Committee wants to act on them. They can just do it on their own. I'm they, not sure they, why they we... will be. They will be. We would take a vote today. It would be reflected in our report to town council that we had this discussion and then finance committee would talk about these, these three things and then they would bring these things up in the vote when the vote came up, discussion came up on appointing these people at a full town council meeting. I, I just don't understand the necessity of our voting on it. We're, we're not the discussion. Right, so we're not going to vote on it, but we could vote on people. We are simply saying that we, by consensus, are asking Andy to do this in for the town council discussion. Yes? Does that, do those questions seem clear and do you feel like it? Yes, it does. And um, I thank you and I don't want to take more Thank you, Andy. Thank you. So now we get to talk about the candidates. So now we get to talk about the candidates. <laughs> and I'm supposed to leave at noon, so I'm hoping we can finish by noon. Okay. Yeah. Please make that a hard stop. Yes, I will. So also we need to do election of officers. So here's my question to you. If noon is our heart, yes? And I also want to be clear for um, 
the recommendations, for, there's actually two discussions we have to have about finance. One is the people themselves, and the second uh, are the terms. Right. Um, because right. I think, right. one, terms these probably need to be staggered terms, and we did not, uh, the recommendation doesn't include a recommendation for staggering, so that's something we have to discuss. Well, also, you also remember that finance committee members, per the charge, are recommended for two years. However, finance committee requested in their charge revision that the first one, this first batch, would be appointed for three years. That was removed from the charge by GOL, and GOL said, if you want this first batch of appointments to be three years, then that can be part of the motion that's made that will we'll bypass the normal appointment. It, I feel as though one, I feel as though that OCA needs to be able to have a recommendation on that. Do we actually recommend that these people are appointed for two years per the charge or three years per the request of finance committee? And then if they're staggered, we also need to assign those. So our conversation is bigger than just these three people. It also includes a discussion of terms. So this is what I would propose is that um, I think that the, the terms need to be discussed before we discuss the people. And obviously, we're not going to get to that. I don't believe we're going to get to that vote today. I think we're not going to. I mean, we can get to the vote. I think we could say that we are going to finish this discussion at quarter of so that, that we can elect a new chair. And I can say what I need to say about stepping down. Um, so we can discuss terms, I would say, right now with a hard stop of that at a little bit before quarter of. That's what I'm proposing. So do we, would we like, how would we like to do this? Alyssa. So I, I think, and I appreciate what Evan said about the terms and the history of that. I think the thing that's been different for us up until this point is that we haven't had choices except that we've known what the term lengths were and then we chose who to put in those term lengths. Correct. We were not given a structure. And so with ranked choice voting and participatory budgeting, in fact, we had to change it on the fly at town council because it wasn't accurate. And so it's great that we will address this in our report to town council um, for a recommendation. I. I think a number of issues are here, one of which includes I, of course, as you all know from the council discussion, I totally disagree with the three-year term for these individuals. I think that's entirely inappropriate, and they're not elected, they're not town employees. It makes no sense that they need to serve for three years. That being said, whatever we choose, and I, whether it's one, two, or three years, there's no obligation that we can't offer a one-year term to someone because we do typically stagger terms, and so even if you one says, well, terms are two years long. There's always somebody that has to get a one-year term if you're going to stagger terms anyway. So I would say that we have every right to, if we can come to some sort of majority agreement anyway, even if not unanimous agreement, on what we would propose as our motion for these various people. But then we would, but then, of course, it's up to the council whether or not they want to amend that, right? right? So we might make the case for one thing, and then the finance committee members make the case for another thing, and then town council decides. But I agree that this is an unusual one that we need to go ahead and just go ahead and lay out why we want to do what we want to do. Right, so um, then I would say let's think very carefully about how we would like to make this motion, and would someone like to make the motion that has to do with term length. So are we thinking three, two, and one? Um, no, I think what it would be is uh, three years, or it would be two years, but they would be staggered, meaning that since we're starting this from the very beginning and there there is no history of resident non-voting members of the finance committee that by that definition, some people or a person would get a one-year term so that things uh, turn over in um, a more uh, um, somebody help me with the word a more appropriate, a more solid uh, way so that you're not losing everybody all at once at the very, very beginning, right? So we're starting this from scratch. We would say two-year term or three-year term. Um, and then staggered, and then mention the staggering, right? That's what I would say. So, I mean, a motion could be that we recommend that the non-voting, the resident non-voting members of the Finance Committee be elected for two years with initial staggered, 
to ask for, I'm not sure. George? We've been told uh, by the committee that um, the learning curve is steep. A one-year appointment to such a body, to me, doesn't make a lot of sense unless the person that's given the one-year appointment is someone who already has served um, on that body for some period of time. This is, in other words, one year, you, you simply learn kind of the basic process. And we've been asked, I think, very clearly to uh, consider at least a two-year term. Um, three years, actually, is what we've been asked. But the point is that there's just a tremendous learning curve here. And to put somebody on this body for one year, um, I, they can be reappointed, fine. And so maybe that's what we'll think. But um, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, by the time your one year is up, you may have just begun to learn how this whole process works, and you're done. Um, so there's a reason why three years was requested. Um, if we feel it's too long, fine. Um, but then you get into staggering terms of one year and two years. Um, and one year makes no sense to me for this body, unless a person is being reappointed and has uh, already served and has lots of experience. Um, otherwise, a minimum of two years seems to be simply out of respect for the person putting all, they're going to put all this time and work into this body, and then they're done. And uh, that makes no sense to me. Um, so at least two years seems to be uh, uh, reasonable. Um, and I can understand the request for three, because people are making a, uh, a very serious commitment of time and effort. And I think the term is supposed to reflect that. Um, I don't understand a one-year appointment to a body like this. Alyssa? So I'm presuming then, George, and I'm not saying this tongue-in-cheek or sarcastically, that you believe that all town councilors should get reelected after their initial two-year term because they put so much time and effort and investment into learning the process, right? Because I, I appreciate that this is hard, but all this work is hard. And I don't understand why three, I get why two, I get why not one, except for somebody who's experienced, but I don't get why we would want it to overlap with counselor terms. That to me is the only reason to do a three year. And if that's the impetus to do it, and then I can disagree on that reason to do it, but I can't agree with it just because it's a long time, a, a length of time that people need because now we know that elected office is two years in this town, even though we're very used to three. So I just, I don't want it to overlap future town councils. So I, I would just say that I ended, oh, Evan. So I guess, so we have to stagger these appointments, right? It doesn't matter whether it's two or three, in, right? We don't have to. It doesn't say in the charge we have to. I know it's GOL's recommendation. Right, that we do that. The rules don't say we actually have to. I don't, I couldn't find it anywhere. It says okay. we have to, but it is our general practice. So I guess the first, com so it might make sense to separate, well, may, I don't know, if it does, but it, to separate the two debates we're having, which is staggering or no staggering, and then three versus two. So the charge, the charge for finance committee is that everyone is appointed for two years. The recommendation was this first set will get three so that it outlasts our current, current term. And so I think that OCA should issue a recommendation about whether we want to actually do that. And so maybe we can keep our conversation narrowly focused on knowing that every other group of appointees in perpetuity will get two-year terms. Do we feel like it's necessary or appropriate for this first batch to get three-year terms so that they outlast this first council, which is the, the reason for doing it. It isn't, it, the three-year terms wasn't, it takes time to get up and running. The, three -year, the reason for the three-year terms was it will outlast this first council. And so that going forward, then they'll always be overlap. It won't be the finance committee members will end what councilors end. Um, because the, the idea is they have two-year term, the de facto is two-year terms, which is, is considered enough to get up and running. So do we want to do that? <laughs> So Alyssa has spoken about what she feels, and I, I would say that I, I tend to agree with her. I, although, you know, we've had a, a great deal of discussion about um, the specialness and the amount of um, knowledge and expertise that people need to have on finance committee, I, I feel uncomfortable, and I don't really think that it's appropriate that we would appoint 
someone um, who was not elected for a, an extra year after you know a, a council has come and gone. That seems. Because you're also saying, I mean, and, and what is that saying? Are we also saying that because it's mostly a finance committee is is run is put together of counselors? So, are you saying that that you think that that counselors there there wouldn't be enough counselors who would have enough information I, to actually run finance committee? And that also makes me feel uncomfortable because. I, I don't think that I would say that. I, I myself would not vote for a, a three-year term. George? I don't have a strong feeling one way or the other, but what I get the feel for this is that the desire for some continuity across um, electoral transitions. So that was what I got from the recommendation, that um, you'll have a change of uh, council members, and but there will be a, at least some continuity on this particular body that would uh, uh, be there during that period of transition, would provide some, what, call it institutional memory or some level of, of just experience with the budget process. It's a it's a complicated process. It's, it's not something you just pick up. I'm still struggling to understand it, and I've been looking at it for six months. Um, and so, so insofar as I think there's a case to be made, maybe it's not a very strong one, is that, that having a three-year term initially, initially would provide this continuity um, during the next election cycle. After that, my understanding is it's two-year terms, correct? So it mirrors, in some sense, um, our position that we have been granted three years. Um, we've now gotten through six months. <laughs> um, we've been granted three years, but from then on, it'll be two years. Um, so I don't have a problem with this special case. Um, if people feel that uh, it's not a good enough reason, fine. Um, let's keep it at two. But I think there was a reason, um, and that's the one that I, that I can glean, is that provides some measure of continuity. And if anyone can think of another reason, that would be great, but that's the only one I have. Could someone explain what it would mean, say we, we decided to do three-year staggered terms, um, only one person, well, we would, that would make it easier to have one, 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 two, one, three, but then only one person would ever get three years, right? Because after that, everybody would get two. Um, is what I'm thinking. It just would be a little bit easier um, to assign them if there were th three years for three people. Um. George? Staggered terms is simply something we can consider. It's not required. It's just GOL thought it was a good idea. Evan? You're on GOL, George. <laughs> G GOL, I don't think, um, discussed staggered terms. Uh, the reason I was bringing up staggered terms is we very often appoint people to staggered terms so that there is sort of that regularity. Um, so any multiple member body under 9.12C, I think, has to be uh, appointed staggered terms. However, I pulled up the definition of multiple member body because I was like, let me just check this, and it does say not including the town council, and my assumption would be a town council committee, even if it has appointed resident members, is still part of the town council, and therefore not a multiple member body, and therefore not subject to 9.12C. So it seems like there is no legal obligation for us to stagger the resident appointments. However, we could still recommend that we do so, right? Because what that might do is say, let's say we do not do the three-year terms, right? And let's say we do two-year terms. So, and let's say they all start July 1, right? So if two people have two-year terms and one person has a one-year term, well, that means that someone else has, to, they either have to be reappointed or someone else is reappointed July 1, 2020. Now that person has a de facto two-year term, which will go beyond the current councils. 
So the staggering could be a way of having this sort of continuity across councils without having to do this one three-year thing, but we don't have to do it. And that's why I said maybe it makes sense to separate these discussions, but maybe it doesn't, is we have two options, right? One is three versus two, and one are staggered versus not staggered, and we can cobble together any recommendation of the two of those, also recognizing it will just be OCA's recommendation, and the council could say, no, we're gonna appoint everyone to three-year terms, no staggering, right? So we're, just, we're here to figure out what do we as the appointments committee recommend as the best way going forward. So I'm just going to put in that that, <clears throat> that is the primary function of staggering terms is that you you are you are never like clearing the decks and taking everybody off a committee at the same time and putting all new people on. You know, I mean, of course, people could be reappointed, but there's also there's also that possibility that you wipe out an entire committee and then put all new people on. So staggering is a way to make sure that you have, like Evan said, some continuity and people who stay, you know, longer than than others. Yeah, I think, yeah. Do you want to make a motion? <laughs> so do we have some sense of, so we know that Alyssa and Sarah <laughs> are not on board with three-year terms. George is amenable to it. I guess I haven't said where I stand on it. My personal belief is it seems unnecessary to do this one-off three-year term. Um, I understand why we did it for the council, although I think that was part learning curve, but it was also part don't elect them in 2018 and made them run for re-election in 2019, because um, we die. Um, <laughs> yes. But to me, if, the, if we're looking for some continuity, I mean, even if we appoint everyone to two-year terms, no staggering, that means that everyone is up for appointment or replacement in July 1, 2021, which means they'll still be from then until January where they'll be working with this council and then potentially from then on. Like there'll be, there'll still be like six months in which they're working with this council sort of in transition before they go into the next council. So I, I, to me, the, the three-year term is necessary. So we, we can we could call the question and, and vote on what we think about this. Uh, we could either do it for the term lengths and then discuss the staggering, or we can do it in one great big bunch. Should we do it without staggering? Alyssa. So I move that whoever we end up recommending to town council that non-voting resident finance committee member terms are a maximum of two years in length. Yeah, that was pretty clever. I'll second that. Yeah. Okay, discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. And so, so we, we have, have term. All right, so we have one hurdle, and um, I, I, keeping to the, the 12 o'clock hard stop, I don't know that, I think that maybe, you know, we still need to ask for public comment. Um, I think we need to decide on whether, you know, obviously we're meeting next Monday, right? I mean, I think we should stop the conversation on this now. Yes, Alyssa. So my problem with that is that I don't know what I'm going to know between now and next Monday that's going to change the conversation for next Monday. So I wonder if we can each express briefly individual thoughts about whether or not we're comfortable with the three candidates that have been recommended. Because if we aren't, then we should be asking somebody to look, we should be asking the designee to look at them. And if we are, then we can just say, yeah, we got time next week. But I, I'm All right, about so we have four minutes. For another we week. have four minutes, and we definitely can do that. I can start with me and say that I, um, in the spirit of uh, consistency, when it comes to term limits, I have some issues with some of the people being brought forth because I, I feel that they are they are not only not they are incredibly competent, <laughs> but again, for all the same reasons that I've, I've brought up. Um, term limits before would be my difficulty, so I don't believe that I would be voting to recommend. Evan? 
voting to recommend term limits? Or we're no, no, about people, people. people. Um, without, I have several questions, and without explanation of them, um, I would vote against this recommendation. George. I think that if we're going to make formally or informally term limits um, a criteria for evaluation of candidates, A, and B, we are going to try to be consistent in um, our application of this. Um, there does seem to be a glaring inconsistency in the current uh, crop of candidates, at least in one case. Um, it would not seem appropriate given the notion that um, uh, term limits is, is an appropriate uh, criteria to use. So I would be, I would probably vote against this as well on that ground of consistency. If we're going to do this, we should be consistent. We've done it once. Um, I wasn't happy about it, but that's what we did. Um, and now we're doing it again, and uh, it seems that uh, just for the sake of consistency, we should. So I would vote against it at the moment. <laughs> Alyssa? So briefly along those lines, so when we talked about this with planning board and ZBA, right? So mm -hmm. planning board, we had a big mm -hmm. argument about it. Mm -hmm. ZBA, we did continue a person on for an additional year because that's what they asked for to help smooth the transition for a body that had some new members on it. Um, that was part of what I was trying to get at when I was asking what does finance committee, knowing what they know now, really need from people because, as I stated earlier, I'm no longer convinced that it needs to be substantial experience from the previous finance committee. Given my relationship with some of those people, that's awkward for me to say. So at most, I would want to consider having the person with all those years of experience only recommended for one year, but I am concerned that since there are only three members, right, like you said, there aren't four anymore, since there are only three, having two of them be former finance committee, given where we are in the process, I'm no longer convinced is essential, and so I'm uneasy. I would, at, at best, I was going to argue that one of the, the most experienced member only get a one-year term, but I'm, I'm also uneasy about the pool in general. So I feel like we've already had the discussion that we need to have a vote. So that was just a completely backward way of doing it, and then I'm just going to call the question. Can I just say something? Yep. Sure. Um, uh, I think that if, if uh, the term limit issue is uh, going to be a criteria, that should be something that is discussed before with the de OCA designee, because that if people knew that in advance, um, they wouldn't uh, apply. And uh, so this is all new to me, that this is the criteria that each of you is using to possibly vote against, because it wasn't something that was discussed by us, and it wasn't something that was given out to potential applicants as a reason why they shouldn't bother to apply. So, um, so. so the thing that I would say about that is that we had a very lengthy and a long-term discussion about term limits, and it was when I brought people forward and I wrote that dandy little memo about what I thought a, a healthy multi-member body should look like, and I would argue that we did talk about that ad nauseum, and I think that the sticking point for me is, is that I'm the one who made the point about term limits, and I really went out on, yeah, I really put myself out there and, and how I felt about term limits. So I don't think that having this discussion is a surprise. I do think that what town council said to us in full is that if we are going to talk about term limits, then OCA itself needs to have a discussion about hard and fast rules on, on that. But I'm going to agree with it, George, and I'm going to agree with my own sense of continuity in saying if I said it about another committee, of course I would say it about if I said about one, I'm going to say it about the other. George? Well, I think in, in sympathy with Darcy, this is something while we have talked a lot about, uh, a lot about it, um, we have not made any formal decision in any way, shape, or form that I'm aware of. Um, so I could understand her sense of, well, you know, 
why didn't you tell me? <laughs> uh, we didn't. Um, but um, so she went ahead with the understanding that this was not something hard and fast and looked at the uh, candidate pool and made a recommendation. So I, I certainly don't uh, fault her in any way, shape, or form. Um, but I do um, have a sense at this point that this is an issue that's been raised now and discussed and something that uh, we need to actually make a decision on. And this forces us yet again to that point. Um, but uh, I don't find fault with what no. you did in any way, shape, or form. I might have done exactly the same thing and be in your shoes. Um, but uh, having said that, um, there is this problem of consistency, and we need to resolve it one way or the other. And maybe that will require at a future meeting an actual vote or some kind of uh, uh, statement of policy on term limits. Um, maybe in the short term we just need to, to make a decision on this particular group of candidates. But at some point, for Darcy's sake and all our sakes, when we go to do these interviews in the future, I think we need to have a clear sense from this body what we mean by term limits and how we expect them to be applied because we don't have that at the moment. And uh, without that, um, she made her judgment, and I don't fault her for that. Um, and I, I'm going to apologize to Darcy if that's the way it came off. I don't fault you at all. I guess what I was trying to say is, is that was my feeling of consistency, and it was something that I had put forward. And so my own personal vote, right, my own personal, you're right, we, we're learning. And there's a lot of things that you could say. We've, we brought up a lot of things that weren't written in concrete that we sent you. We just sent you out sailing, and we all had different ideas in our heads. So I find zero fault in, in what you did. Let me make that really, 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 really clear. I'm just saying that, that, that my personal vote is not so much, is, is, has to do with the consistency and the things that I said about um, planning and zoning. So I just want to make that clear that it's absolutely no hit to you. I think you did a fabulous job. And that we did, we did have you sail out without some pertinent information or assumptions on our part. Evan? Right, so my, my recollection of the conversation of term limits was that we were not going to um, abide by term limits as a hard and fast rule for our first set of appointments. And so Darcy's absolutely right. There was, there was no guidance that said you have to abide by them. And so um, my decision isn't, oh, we have to do term limits because we did agree that we weren't going to uh, make those necessarily, you know, uh, uh, I keep using the word litmus test today, but a litmus test, right? Um, my, my personal thought on them is if you have a pool where someone is clearly so qualified you need them and other people are not, then I would, then you can sort of suspend that term limits is what we had agreed um, to, bring them, to bring them along. I don't feel like that's the case here. Um, and so looking at this, uh, my, my, I, I am not beholden to any term limits necessarily, and, and I think that OCA should have a discussion about whether we want to have them. And, um, but my decision isn't just term limits, it's term limits in the context of the broader pool. And I think that that's the important distinguishing point here is it's not, yes, term limits, no term limits. It's this should be our general guiding principle that we might want to overrule given some circumstances. But in this circumstance, I don't see any necessity to do that. Which is, which as Alyssa brought up, we did do, you know, with Zoning Board of Appeal. Like, so that, that, is the, that is our consideration of, of what makes up a healthy multi-member body and that was our, our thinking and that, yeah, that we're saying that it's yes, term limits, but also would there be a reason to hold someone over if there wasn't enough expertise? And I think uh, for myself, I would say that um, my feeling is, is that I would not agree with that. I would just add that if we do adapt something like that, we should put that in the posting, um, that we aren't going to consider anyone who has exceeded X amount of terms or whatever so that they don't waste their time applying for, uh, or and say, interviewers don't waste their time interviewing people that we've already decided aren't eligible. Agreed. Alyssa? Agreed, except we've never used it as a hard and fast thing. It is an existing thing. The town manager's using it. We've looked to it. Yes, the town council hasn't adopted it. Yes, we cannot. I will never support saying six years and done no matter what. So I don't want to tell people that. Mm -hmm. I will tell people mm -hmm. that 
it's not likely you'll be, rec you'll be reappointed if you have a long number of years of experience, but there are some circumstances in which you could make the case or others could make the case that we need you to do that, like we just did with ZBA, like we have done numerous times in the past when we had the six-year term limit clearly in place. And so I don't want to tell people they can't, but I do want to give them realistic expectations. I agree that we want to give them realistic expectations, and that wasn't even really possible in this particular circumstance because, of course, no one's experienced in having this role on the Finance Committee because it's never been one before. So it, it would have been really awkward to say, well, what do we count toward that? So, yeah. George? So we do have, Alyssa mentioned this earlier, but I think she may have another objection, so this may not really work, but we do have the option of, um, using a one-year appointment um, and then a two-year appointment, right? We could stagger appointments and the one-year appointment could be given to a candidate who has this, right? Um, with, I think, I don't know how formal it has to be, but with the understanding that this would not probably lead to reappointment because of the length of service that's been involved. So that would offer us a way forward um, short of having to send this all back. I mean, it's not clear to me what happens if we do, in fact, um, reject the recommendations that Darcy has made. We're rejecting all three, and it goes back to what? I mean, what actually, Evan, help me here. Um, I, we, we have been considering all recommendations as a suite, but there's no requirement for us to do so. We, we could make a motion on each of these names individually. And I guess I'm just a little uncomfortable picking, at this point, picking people out. Um, and we've gone through the process, the interviews have been done, the recommendation has been made. It doesn't, I understand it doesn't commit us to anything, but I think as a matter of just respect um, for the people who've gone through it and for the fact that we've not been explicit or clear about this issue of term limits, that um, I think a reasonable and appropriate way forward would be to use staggered uh, term limits, to, excuse me, use staggered terms here and use the one year appointment um, for the candidate that has the, the greatest amount of experience with the understanding, either formal or informal, that this would not lead to reappointment. That's what I would suggest. Alyssa had mentioned it earlier, that, but that I think she had sense. another objection. That makes sense to me if, if we're going down that road. Evan? So I, I want to say two things. One is we're beyond our self-imposed deadline. Uh, I, I'm a, this process was always done as we have one person bringing forth people and OCA can decide whether or not to accept them or reject them and those candidates are offered this tentatively with the understanding that they might not get it. Um, I understand the idea of with respect to them but they're aware of the circumstance and, and I, I don't want to craft a solution to make something work for appointees that I don't agree with just out of respect for the fact that they've been offered something. And so for me personally, and maybe we're not ready to vote on this, but for me personally, um, I have questions about why this person versus others, and I don't want to, to try to say, well, well, so let's just do this because we've already told them when I actually have an issue with this person being put forth. So yeah. I, I think we're at a point where we either need to table this until next time or vote on it, and I don't care which way we vote. And I would just like to, yeah, and I would just like to agree with Evan. I mean, we, we had this as a check and balance. So if we're finding that this is not a check and balance, then we really need to think about that. If OCA feels that it's obligated, then yeah, we're just rubber stamping it, and then I don't think that's what we intended. So, um, So it sounds to me like we're not ready for a motion, and so in that case, can we just ask that the Finance Committee get back to us with their information prior to our meeting next Monday, so we at least have that new piece of information that will help inform our discussion next Monday. Yeah. And for the sake of the minutes, um, and may, this could perhaps be done after the meeting, but I just need to be clear in the minutes, what exactly, we're, or do we need to have it written in the minutes, what exactly we're asking FinCom to do, or I'm just going to read or would we trust that the, the chair um, would be able to? We just, we, we, just we said it, it, so it's. It's in there, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm a, I'll talk to the minutes fine. taker and, and <laughs> <Okay>. see, what, <laughs> see what he thinks. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're tabling this. We have a hard stop in five minutes. Um, 
uh, this is what I'm, <laughs> holy cow. So, are we, well, do you want to vote for, okay. So I guess we'll, without, we'll, we'll do things in a little crazy order. Should we have public comment before we elect a chair? No public comment. <laughs> All right, so, um, I have some um, family matters that require a great deal of my attention for right now. Um, the attention that I need to spend as a mom um, makes me feel that um, at this time, um, I am not effectively able to put in the time that's needed to be chair. That being said, I would like to say that I have absolutely loved being chair and I absolutely love this committee. So with that being said, um, I, am, I have already um, officially stepped down as chair, and um, I would like to appoint a new chair, and I would like to, to offer someone. I would like to make a, a motion. I would like to nominate. So I would like to nominate Evan Ross as the future chair of OGA. I would second that nomination. Would you accept this? I would accept that nomination. Will you accept this, Rose? <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> this has been a crazy meeting. <laughs> okay, so um, would we have any discussion on my nomination? Well, I, uh, not really discussion, but I, I just for the record, and I think I speak for everyone on the committee, um, we're grateful for everything you've done. Um, and sad that you have to step away, but it's for good reason. Um, but you have put in enormous amount of work, and uh, so I just want to express my gratitude for what you've done. And I take it you're still going to be with us. I right? am absolutely okay. going to be with you, so, yes. All right, <laughs> anyway, thank you, Sarah, very much for what you've done up to this point. Thank you, George, that was kind. I would like to second that, and also say that should I uh, be elected chair, I would be, I am very grateful uh, that you took the chair position during what <laughs> will certainly go down in history as the most difficult, <laughs> fraught, contentious, <laughs> stressful part of this committee. And so we'll always have... Uh, Paris, we'll always have we'll, Paris. We'll, always, we'll, we'll always owe you more we'll of remember the wine you, than you can ever drink. Thank you, Thank you so much, Evan. Okay, Alyssa. While we're saying nice things, just to add on, I know we're out of time, but the way that you have managed when we've been frustrated with each other to negotiate, here's what I'm hearing, here's what I think we're doing, without just going like a listen, going, <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> um, yeah, because I gave up on that poker face once town meeting was over, so thank you. You've, been a, you've done a terrific job. As Evan says, I would argue, I know the finance committee might disagree with me, but I would argue the <laughs> most difficult thing that we've had to do in committee work has been this, so thank you. Thanks, Guy. <laughs> so I, I would second that too, and, uh, and Alyssa, I assume this means that you want to continue as vice chair? If people agree to that, but we can <laughs> have a formal election, that would be fine. Yeah, I think it was only me that was stepping down, but yeah. I mean, Tradition says that when you reorganize, you reorganize. And since we don't have a, an official minute, right, well, we okay. have to reorganize that. All right, well, we can do that. But let's, okay, so let's I have nominated time. Evan. Evan has accepted the nomination. It has been seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right, and so then if we have to reorganize uh, for vice chair, I, I would nominate Alyssa. I would second that nomination. Any discussion? Oh, do you accept, do you accept this, Rose? <laughs> Thank you. No, I'd, I'd love to still be in that support role. I appreciate that. Okay. Any any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And with that, I would like to. Um, I would like to. In the back, there is. I could go back and get it. I don't know how fast I could go. He's going to be one of those gavels. Yeah, he is. Don't give George a gavel. Okay, and I am going to. Um, Oh, Evan, your chair. Do you want to? Do you want to? Do you want to adjourn us? Do you want to come sit in this big chair and, and I, adjourn? I can sit here and say, uh, 
so we can adjourn. Do we, need, we don't need to have a motion to adjourn. We can just adjourn, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll move. We'll I will entertain a motion to adjourn uh, with the meeting yeah, we'll meeting next week here, 9.30, July 1. All right. All right. So then we are adjourned at noon exactly. Hard stop.